Welcome to What is Office 365. My name is Becky Wiegand, and I'm the Webinar Program Manager here at TechSoup where I have been on staff for seven years as a Webinar Manager and also managing our blog and article content for a long time. Prior to that I spent a decade working with small nonprofits in Washington, D.C. and Oakland, California. So I'm glad to be your host today. Mostly joining us on the line you'll hear from Sam Chankin today. He is the Director of Solution Development for Tech Impact, a Philadelphia-based nonprofit that provides technology support and cloud services to nonprofits, charities, and NGOs around the world. Sam has worked with nonprofits for his entire career. And his passion is designing and implementing technology rooted in context, ensuring that it's meeting the real-world goals and challenges of the organizations that he supports. He's going to be our primary presenter today, but we may also hear from or see Linda Widdup on the back end who is the Director of Technology Service at Tech Impact. And she manages all of the aspects of their client relationships including providing nonprofits with project plan and budget plan development, implementation oversight, and resource allocation to their projects. So we're happy to have both of them on the line. You'll also see on the back end Kevin Lowe who is going to be assisting with chat and will be capturing your questions throughout the webinar. Kevin and I are located here in our San Francisco headquarters at TechSoup. And Sam is in New York today. Linda is in New Jersey. Feel free to chat in to us to let us know where you are joining from. We know we have people from all over the world, all over the country, and we are glad to have you with us. Most of today's presentation will apply to anybody no matter where they are, uh, but some of the donation specific information will apply primarily to those who are in the United States. So, Keep that in mind if you are joining from someplace outside of the United States that some of the donations may not be available to you or may have a different path to become available to you. So while you are chatting into us, we have about 175 people on the line right now. And here's a quick introduction of what we'll be covering today. We'll do an introduction to TechSoup and Tech Impact. We'll do a poll question just to get an idea of who on the line is already using Office 365. I'm assuming many of you are brand new to it, and that would make sense, but we want to have a better idea, not just my assumptions. And then we'll talk about what is Office 365, and we will do a brief review of the licensing and donation options. And then Sam will take us into the meat of today's webinar in showing Office 365 live on his desktop so you can see what it's all about and how it can be leveraged for your organization. We'll have time for Q&A throughout, so feel free to ask those questions as they come to you. To get us started with TechSoup, we are a global network of 63 partner NGOs working in 121 countries worldwide to provide you, other nonprofits and libraries, with resources, knowledge, and technology to help meet your mission and change the world. You can learn about our programs in our 2014 Year in Review, but you can also see where we are at around the world on this map. If there is a dot anywhere near you, then we may have a Net Squared Local group that you can meet up with, or other services or partner NGOs. We are serving over 615,000 NGOs to the tune of delivering more than $4.8 billion in technology, products, and donations to the NGO sector. And we do that largely through donation partners like Microsoft who donate their products and do it through TechSoup's mechanisms. So we are happy to be playing that role in civil society to help you access greater valuable technology that can help you work more efficiently at a reasonable price. So you can find out more about our donation programs at TechSoup.org. So let's dive into the poll question, and then I'll have T Sam come on the line just to introduce Tech Impact a little bit and their work. So have you used or are you using Office 365? Are you using it now at your organization? Uh, do you have a donation but maybe you are not actually using it yet? Uh, maybe you've used it in a past organization. And maybe you are not using it or don't have a donation. Sorry, the N is cut off there. It's a little short uh, on my ability to fill it in completely. Or maybe you have some other comments on your usage of Office 365 that you'd like to share in the chat. We have folks saying that they're doing research. And some, the majority so far are saying that they're not using it. So that's helpful. You're in the right place. But for those of you who are using it, you hopefully will learn some additional things because it's a big suite of applications in the cloud that you can choose from. So maybe you are using parts of it. Uh, somebody commented that I'm using Office 365 personally, but not with my organization. 
So give just a few more seconds for everybody to participate. And one person comments, I've been approved for a trial, but I need to know which version to get. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And some other people commenting that they've gotten the trials, but they haven't started implementing yet, and that they're going forward with it and hoping to get more information about how to do that today. So just showing the results. We have more than 100 people saying that they are not using it and don't have a donation. That's 67% of our audience right now. So this is helpful to see. For the 14.6% of you who are using it, we hope that you'll still get a good deal of information out of today's webinar. And in particular, we're running another webinar on the 25th of June, also with Sam and Linda. And uh, that will talk a little bit more about some of the new features that have just recently been introduced. So in particular, that one would be especially valuable and some of the more advanced features. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and have Sam come on the line just to talk a little bit about Tech Impact and then to give us an introduction of what Office 365 is. Welcome to the program, Sam. <laughs> Thanks, Becky. Hi, everyone. My name is Sam. I'm Director of Solution Development at Tech Impact, uh, formerly NPower PA. And I've been with Tech Impact about seven years now. Uh, you know, we have impact in the name, and that's because we are a nonprofit. <clears throat> We're a 501c3, and all of our clients are also nonprofit organizations, 501c3s, 501c4s, all kinds of nonprofits. And our goal is to help use technology um, to better serve our world. Right? So we do that in two ways, one of which is by doing direct interventions, training um, individuals who have been underserved in IT skills. And then the other way is by providing IT services to nonprofit organizations. And that's uh, primarily the context in which I work. Um, Tech Impact provides um, a bunch of different services. We have over 100 organizations around the country that we provide managed IT services to. Uh, and then we also provide cloud implementation services. So that's why we're going to talk about Office 365. Uh, we have done um, I think about 700 projects now helping organizations move to various pieces of Office 365. So I think it's something that we know a little bit about. Um, we are a Silver Microsoft partner. We also do things like outsource data management and sort of other softer um, support, support offerings for nonprofit organizations. Um, and here's a pretty map of where some of our clients are. So you can see we're primarily in the United States, um, but we certainly work around the world as well. Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, a, just a couple slides about what is Office 365, uh, and then we'll move into a demo. The bulk of this presentation today is going to be a demo. Um, as I'm sure you've noticed if you've tried to go to the Microsoft site for Office 365, it's very difficult to understand what it is, uh, and in particular how it might be helpful for a small nonprofit organization as opposed to a large corporate entity. And really I'm hoping to help you understand that today your organization. So please, if you do have any questions at all during today's presentation, just type it into the chat window. I'll be pausing periodically uh, and asking Becky if there's any questions that you know, weren't answered in the chat, and there will be people answering questions directly there as well. Okay, so this is the core of Office 365. Basically Office 365 are server products that you can install on your local server, but they're hosted for you by Microsoft. Right? And for the most part, they are donated for free by Microsoft to nonprofit organizations. So this is the ability for organizations to not need a server, to not need to set stuff up, and to not need to maintain stuff on-premise. They can just sign up for Office 365 and get access to these same tools. So those tools are hosted Exchange. Exchange is an email collaboration tool that includes shared calendars and contacts. File collaboration and storage through SharePoint. Uh, which is another product you can install um, on site if you wanted to, uh, and OneDrive, which is sort of a personal file management tool that we'll talk about. You can also get subscriptions for Microsoft Office through Office 365, and everything's named the same thing, which is why one of the reasons this is confusing. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, and be happy to answer your questions on the line. But you know, if you have over 50 users, um, or you know, if you're working with a lot of volunteers who come in and out of the organization frequently, you can subscribe to the version of Office that you install locally on your computer through Office 365. You also get access to uh, Microsoft Link, which is now Skype for Business, um, which is a web conferencing and IM tool. Uh, video conferencing, you can run uh, meetings through it. 
etc. And you get access to group collaboration with Yammer. So all of these are things that I'm going to actually be demoing for you today so that you can get a feeling for them. There's a lot of other stuff too with Office 365. Right? Other stuff. So, um, and I'm going to mention these. Some of these I'm going to show in the demo. Some of them I'm not going to show in the demo. But Office 365 is a really, really big thing. Basically, Microsoft is committed to making most of their tools available in the cloud, and most of them at really significant discounts for nonprofits. So these are some of the other things you might hear about. Uh, Dynamic CRM, Power BI, which is a reporting and dashboarding tool, Microsoft Project for project management, Visio for diagramming. There's even Azure Active Directory. There's a lot of tools that are available in the cloud. Um, some of them uh, are part of Office 365. All of them are integrated with Office 365. Just a little bit about how Office 365 can help you. Um, so you know, one thing, uh, for small organizations, if you are popping for your email, if you are using IMAP, if you are using webmail right now, right, you might not have access to shared calendars. You might not have access to online file collaboration. Right? All these tools might not be available to you. So for small organizations, you can really bypass the server step and move straight into Office 365 and have everything available to you from anywhere. Uh, for mid-sized organizations that already have this stuff on premise, uh, you can um, you can get rid of one or more or all of your servers. So you don't have to worry about patches, uh, patching it or supporting it. You don't have to worry about replacing it every four years because Microsoft is upgrading everything for you in the back end. Less to worry about in terms of IT. Uh, one of the big things with Exchange is backing it up and getting a backup off-site. You don't have to worry about that with Office 365. Microsoft is doing that for you. And for large organizations, it's all about you know, lowing, lowering costs and getting access to new technologies. And one of, the be, one of the great things here is that Office 365 allows organizations big and small to have access to, um, to the same tools. Right? So we don't have to make compromises because we're small organizations anymore. Here are some of the reasons why nonprofit orgs love Office 365. So, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of different tools. I've worked with Google Apps. Some of our clients use Google Apps. Some of the reasons why uh, we chose to really specialize in Office 365 um, is that uh, it provides a really familiar experience. Right? It's the same tools you're already using, but they're in the cloud. So you don't have to learn anything brand new. So you know, you're still using Outlook and Word and Excel and PowerPoint, right? but, uh, but now it's all, all the actual data is stored in the cloud. Um, and then you know, it allows mobility. You can be anywhere. Like Becky mentioned, I, I live and work in New York. We have staff in California, and we have staff in Delaware, and our main office is in Philadelphia. And we all just work the same way, no matter where we are. You know, I have video chats every day with my staff. Uh, and then uh, disaster protect protection, you know, if, if you, there is a natural disaster, if you have an issue, you can still provide services to your clients even in that situation, and you don't have to worry about your IT. Uh, and uh, let's face it, uh, free is a pretty good price. Okay, so I know we powered through a lot, of co a lot of content there. Becky, are there any questions that we should take right now, or should we just dive right into getting the donation? You know, we did have one person ask, can you use it if you're on Windows Vista? Does it matter what your operating system is, uh, whether you can use Office 365? Yep, that's a great question. So generally anything that's still in Microsoft mainstream support you can use with Office 365. Some things may work better than other things. Windows Vista should be fine. You do need to be using Office 2010 at a minimum, and really everything works much better with Office 2013. And for the demo today, I'm actually going to be using the preview of Office 2016. Ooh, fancy. You got the new thing. Nice. Um, we also had a question before we move on, um, just asking you know, in particular, how does Outlook Exchange email dif differ from the Outlook web app version of hosted email? Is there a big difference between that or with the hosted Outlook? I know you're going to show it live too, but yeah, I, I think maybe we'll wait to answer that question until after I demo that piece, and we can see if, if it's still not clear. Sure, that sounds good. Why don't we go ahead and move forward. For those of you that have submitted questions, we have them in the queue, so we'll get to them as we move forward. So okay, if you can go ahead and – Do you nope, want me to do – Yep. Oh. oh, sorry, you're right. I am moving forward. <laughs> sorry about that. I wanted to quickly, before we get started with the demo, just show Office 365 licensing options. And I can continue answering questions about this in 
the chat window throughout, but I want to quickly show what's available through the donation program. So we have a link on TechSoup that uh, shows Office 365 nonprofit. And we don't actually fulfill this through TechSoup or through the, tech, uh, the Microsoft Volume Licensing Service Center, which is something that if you've gotten donations through TechSoup before from the Microsoft program you may be familiar with. What this link does, if you click to Get It Now right there on our site, it actually takes you to a Microsoft Corporate Citizenship page. And down at the bottom of this page there's a link where you can see the different pricing options and different licensing options. If you looked at this a year ago, you would have seen two options, the E1 and E3 options. They've since expanded it to have four options available. Two of them are completely free. You see there's no cost. Those are fully donated options. And two of them have fees associated. And those are fees, uh, basically a, a subscription fee that you would pay per user per month based on having installed Office on your computer in addition to Office 365 in the cloud. So for example, if you get donated Office uh, Suite through the Microsoft Donation Program, then it's probably not all that likely that you would need one of these paid options. You may be able to just have that installed license and then access Office 365 in the cloud, use the web apps free versions, use the installed desktop version if you want to. You don't need to have both. If you want to use just the web apps you can. Just know that some of the features may not be the same, may not be as robust for things like spreadsheets and things like that. So keep that in mind. You may want to have installed still. Um, so you can either pay one of these fees to Microsoft to essentially rent access to installed Office 365, or you can get it for free or get it through TechSoup's donation program if you need the full Office installed on your desktop. Um, if you need more than 50 licenses, which is the limit in Microsoft's program with TechSoup, then you know, if you have 75 staff people and you need 25 to have installed desktop, then maybe you'd pay the fee for the 25 additional staff for example. So, Anyway, we'll include a link to this page where you can see the different options, what's included, what, uh, and there's a big long full list. I'm not going to go through all of it right now. But um, you can select one of these options, request to start the free trial. The trial begins, so you can play around with it, go in there. And then we get a note here at TechSoup to say, this organization has requested a free trial of this. And if you're already in, micro in TechSoup's system and you've requested and received donated Microsoft before, then we automatically validate you to receive this donation. And then it upgrades automatically to a fully fledged, no longer a trial Office 365 account. If you have not and you're new to TechSoup, then we just have to verify that you're actually an eligible 501c3 organization and that you meet the different criteria that Microsoft outlines for their donation program. And so that usually happens within a few weeks. Uh, I think the trial period is you know, 30 or 60 days, and then it automatically upgrades if you need more time on the trial. I know Microsoft allows people to extend their trials, um, but it does upgrade provided that we're able to validate you. And then you've got fully fledged Office 365 to move forward with. So that's just a quick rundown. I'll try to answer some of the questions that are in the chat window while Sam goes ahead and shows us his demo. Thanks so much, Sam. Absolutely. Okay. Okay, so let's do a demo. We're going to do a live demo, which is always scary. Hopefully everything works today. Okay. Um, one thing I want to point out is that this is an abbreviated version of a demo that we do every other week. Um, and you can uh, attend that demo anytime you want. It's free. You can go to our website, techimpact.org, and click on Blog and Events in the upper right-hand corner. So let's start by taking a look at Office 365 Outlook Web Access. Right? So this is Office 365 here. You can see if I click in my upper left-hand corner, I have a list of all the different apps that are available to you. So everything that we're looking at right here is part of the web interface of Office 365. One distinction I want to make really clear is that Office 365 is the cloud back end to all of these tools. Right? It's what's going on in the Internet, and it's the web interface for those tools. 
You can access many things in Office 365 through the standard Office applications that are installed on your computer. And those Office applications that are installed on your computer are the same Office applications you are using right now, maybe a later version, but they are not any different when you are using them with Office 365 versus something else. So we can see here, I have my inbox. This is all of my email. Um, I can access all of my folders directly here. So if any of you are using POP email right now where you have different folders when you are viewing the web interface, you can see that um, everything is the same. right? So here I am looking at all this data online. And I can also go to my regular Outlook here. And I'm using the preview. So it says unlicensed. I promise it's licensed. And I'm looking at the same data right here with the same folders. Okay? This is Outlook on my local computer. It is the same as the Outlook that you are using. It's a later version, but it's the same thing. And this version of Outlook you can buy from TechSoup the same way you're doing right now, or you can rent it from Microsoft. But either way, it's the same thing. It's the same version of Outlook. So I think that's a really important thing to point out. Um, as part of Office 365, or if you are using Exchange Server now, you already know this, but if you are using POP email or something like that, I just want to point out, um, we can do things like access other people's mailboxes. So if I have permissions to access other people's mailboxes, here is a shared account, Tech Impact Accounting. And this is a separate mailbox that I can access from one place, just from my Outlook. Okay? And I can do the same thing from the web interface. I can also do shared calendaring. And I don't know how anyone lives without this. So you know, here are other people in my organization. If I want to know what Linda is doing because I want to schedule a meeting with Linda and Pat, I can check the, the boxes next to both of their calendars, and it's going to overlay their calendars. And here I can see you know, that this Monday at 11 a.m. there was a time when I could have scheduled a meeting when everyone is free. Okay? This is all included for free as part of Office 365. If you are using Outlook Web Access right now on a local server, you will see that this is Outlook Web Access, but it looks different probably than what you are using right now because it is a later version. So uh, for instance, um, with the new version, I can overlay calendars directly in the web interface as well. So I click the check boxes, and it's going to load their calendars, and it's going to show all of that information overlaid in one place in the web interface in addition to in Outlook on my local computer. Um, okay, uh, Becky, any questions about Outlook or Outlook Web Access that we should cover? Um, yeah, well we did have that question earlier just asking how does Outlook Exchange differ from the Outlook Web App versus the installed version? So kind of the comparison of the three. So Exchange is the server-side software. And server-side Exchange, the server version that you might install on-premise, is very, very similar to the server version that Microsoft uses in Office 365. So this is still Exchange. It's just hosted for you. Um, and uh, you know, the, the back end looks a little bit different. If we have time, I'll show you the administrative interface for Office 365. But they're very, very similar. It's probably a newer version than what you're using right now. So right now this is Exchange 2013 is what Office 365 is running on. And when the next version of Exchange comes around, you will automatically be upgraded to that. And I've been through two of those major upgrades, and I've never had a problem. So Microsoft is very good at that. Outlook Web Access is the web interface for Exchange. So if I'm not on a computer that has uh, Outlook installed, I can just go to this website, mail.office365, and access my inbox. And I have access to most of the same functionality that I have with locally installed Outlook, but not all the same functionality. So you might want to use Outlook on your local computer because it has more abilities in terms of scheduling or you know, um, formatting your messages, that kind of thing. Um, or you might want to use Outlook locally installed because you can have offline access to all your mail, although you can have limited offline access with the web version as well. Uh, you can also connect your phones to Office 365 email through ActiveSync the same way you're probably doing right now if you have an Exchange server. Great. Uh, we also had a question from Miguel asking, uh, do you have to use Exchange? Because we have Google for Nonprofit that we are using for our email, and we would like to stay with that option. Uh, can you continue using Google's email if that is what you are on? Or do you have to go forth – if you use Office 365, do you have to have your email hosted on it? Nope, you don't have to. You can license your users um, with the E1 licenses, the, the free licenses, but sort of uncheck the Exchange box so that they don't have email. Now you do lose some of the benefits of being in one platform, right? So you know, if you guys really like Gmail, you might want to consider using Google Drive and Google Chat, right? But if those aren't good options for you, you know, if you really want the familiarity of the interface or, or some of the centralized control that you get with SharePoint or OneDrive, then yes, you can absolutely just do those in Office 365. 
Great. And we had one clarification question uh, that a couple of people have actually asked. Do you have to have the installed version of, of Office on your desktop in order to use Office 365? And the answer is no. That's a really good question. Yep. <laughs> but go ahead. You can, you can expand on that if you want to. Yeah, you, you don't have to. Um, so, and, and I'll get into this a little bit more when we get to SharePoint, but there are web-based versions of Outlook and Word and PowerPoint and OneNote um, and Excel. But the web-based versions don't have all the same functionality. Right? So um, I would say that for really basic Office users or people who only use email, they absolutely do not need Office installed. Um, but for users who want to, you know, in Word if they want to do um, complex formatting and, and mail merges or form merges or you know, build table with contents and stuff like that, they're probably going to need the locally installed version of Office. Same for you know, using complex formulas in Excel, etc. Great. We had okay. one last question just asking about calendars and whether you know, if you are using the calendaring from Outlook in Office 365, can that be embedded on your website externally? It cannot. You would think, but no. I know. Um, I talked to myself know. about that too. Yep. <laughs> Great. Um, Thank you. Okay. I think we can move Absolutely. forward. Thanks. Great. So one of the nice things about Office 365 is that there's all these things that uh, you know, maybe don't work wonderfully if you try to get them working on your local server. right? They can be really hard to get to play nicely together. But Microsoft is making that work for you. So one of the things I want to point out here um, is that we have integrated presence with Skype for Business. So you can see here this is Ebony Taylor. right? She's one of my coworkers. Here's her picture. And you can see there's this green bar next to her face right there. And that tells me that she is online and available with chat. So I can actually just click on this Send an IM right there. And I can start a chat um, with Ebony. And I'm going to warn her that I'm doing a demo, right? Uh, and, uh, and then I can chat back and forth with her. I can also do a video sharing session right here, um, or I can do a screen sharing session as well. So all of this is directly within Skype for Business. Um, one of the great things I can do with Skype for Business is that I can also um, invite people who are not in my organization and who do not have Office 365 accounts. So I can embed a link for a Skype for Business meeting inside of my calendar appointment, and I can invite participants to it. And they can share their video, and they can share their screen, and I can share my screen, and we can do a meeting with up to 250 participants um, just within Skype for Business. And again, this is all free. So you know, the interface isn't as nice. It's not, as, it's not quite as seamless as something like ReadyTalk, but it is a free tool. Um, and it does have some more flexibility in certain circumstances circumstances as well. So that's a really great tool that I wanted to make known to you. Um, one fun thing is that Skype for Business is not Skype. Okay? So be aware of that. Um, I cannot call regular telephones with Skype for Business. Okay? So even though it has Skype in the name, I can't call a regular phone number. So um, that is something that is probably coming in the next year to two years, but it's not there yet. I think there's a lot of regulatory concerns involved. Uh, so just know that even though it has the same name, it doesn't have all the same functionality as regular Skype. Um, any questions about Skype for Business? I know we're moving quickly, but I want to make sure we have time. Let's see. I'm going through. Um, we had a question asking, are there bandwidth limitations on Skype for Business? Um, I mean, yes, there certainly are. Uh, I mean, if you want to do really high quality video sharing, then you know, you're going to need a decent Internet connection. But it's the same requirements as using Skype or any other kind of video sharing tool. And, and this, the quality will scale up and down depending on the speed of your Internet connection. Are there any costs involved in Skype for Business, or is it free as part of Office 365? Skype for Business is absolutely free. If you want to do what we're doing right now where some people can be dialed in to a phone number and some people can be using audio on the computer, then you do need to pay money for that conference bridge service. And there are a number of third-party organizations that are offering that. You could also do what we do. Uh, there's a great little service called freeconferencecallhd.com. And we do screen sharing with Skype for Business, and then we do audio in a dial-in. So that is another option. Great. Yeah, so it's really if you have people that have to dial in by phone and can't just do it through the computer speakers, then that's when you right. need so to you can do it. Personal. Yep, so you can do it all through the computer speakers or all through the phone. But in order to have some people on one and some people on the other one, you need to pay money. Right. Uh, Tommy asks, does Skype for Business integrate with an on-site PBX? So if you want to connect it with your regular phone, <laughs> can you do that? 
Um, the, the simple answer is yes. Um, the complex answer is that it's incredibly complicated. Uh, and if that's a conversation you want to have, then we can certainly talk about it. Certainly your system needs to be um, Skype for Business or Link compatible, and you will need a Link server on premise. Uh, and there's a bunch of steps involved. So that's the simple complicated answer. <laughs> yes, right. Um, we have to all three. Right. We also have a question from Todd asking, what would we need to host a board meeting use Skype, using Skype for Business? Just be inviting well, your board members? Do they have to have Office 365 themselves? Nope. Can they they absolutely do not have join? to have Office 365. They can just have a camera. We, uh, we have a conference room, and we have this pretty inexpensive. It was I think $600, this Logitech conference camera that's um, Skype for Business compatible plugged into a little computer in our conference room. And we get really, really high quality audio, and we can see many people's faces at once hooked up to a TV there. So you know, under $1,000 we set up a really, really high quality video conferencing system. So you know, they'll need um, a computer that can be a Mac or a PC. Uh, and if they want to share their video, they'll need a video camera. But um, other than that, uh, it's really nothing required. And does Skype for Business allow remote control or remote access and screen sharing? It absolutely does. Now it's not really a great solution for remote IT support because it doesn't handle uh, UAC elevated controls. So, uh, but it's, it's really good if you're trying to walk someone through something or give them a little bit of a training. I use that many times a day uh, with my staff. It's really, really a useful thing. Great. I think we've answered most of the Skype ones, so we can go ahead and keep moving forward. And I'll continue answering questions in chat. <laughs> okay, great. So we're going to move into SharePoint, which is the big scary one. Okay, so we are now looking at SharePoint. Okay, um, You can see it is a website primarily. Um, I do have access to all the apps right from here. So one of the nice things about Office 365 is that everything is nicely integrated in one place. SharePoint is organized into sites which are sort of similar to maybe different network drives or folders on your local computer. So one of the things that SharePoint can do is it can be a replacement for your MAP network drives right now. Right? So instead of going to my computer and going to your Z drive, you go to the SharePoint website and you can access all your files there. We can see up at the top I have a list of all of our different sites. We have too many sites. Don't do what we did. Uh, we've learned a lot since we implemented um, this like five years ago. Um, and of course, you know, we're always the last people to, to fix our own stuff. Um, but each of these are different sites, and each has different permissions. Each site has different content. So we're, we're kind of in the folder paradigm here, right? So right now we're on the home site. And you can see we have an expense report, and we have fundraising, we have some human resources. I also can go to our training site, and here we have training documents and a notebook and, and a webinars calendar. Right? So different content in each of these different sites, different permissions for each site. Um, you will um, also see that we can store things that are not just files inside of SharePoint Online. So I'll get to that, but for now I just want to mention that. SharePoint can do a lot more than file management. Right? And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but I think it's an important seed to plant. Uh, you know, eventually you can actually track a lot of stuff in this tool. So right now we are looking at a document library, and a document library contains documents, shocker, uh, and we have folders the same way we would on premise. Okay, so you know, folders, files, etc., all in SharePoint Online. Right now we're looking at the web interface. If I click on one of these documents here, this is an Excel document, right? I have the Excel logo. It's going to open up in Excel Online, and I mentioned this before, right? So there are web-based versions, there are online versions of Excel, Word, PowerPoint, and OneNote. Okay? So for those tools, there is a website that you can just open. You don't need anything locally installed. It's, it's JavaScript based. You don't even need a plugin. Okay? I'm in view mode right now, but I can edit this workbook and I can edit in Excel Online. And here I'm in Excel Online. You can see the interface looks very similar to how it looked, um, you know, to how Excel on my local computer looks. Okay? So I can, um, you know, and I can edit here. With the web-based versions, I get live concurrent editing. So if there are multiple people editing this document at one time, we can all see the changes that we're making in real time. And that is the case with all of the web-based applications. Okay? Now let's say I'm working on this document, and I've reached the extent of what I can do um, in Excel Online. Or I'm about to start traveling, but I want to keep working on this document while I'm traveling, and I don't have an Internet connection. I can click on this button up here called Open in Excel. 
and it's going to launch Excel on my local computer, and it's going to open up this Excel file. So this is the same file. This is one of the big benefits of SharePoint Online versus something like Google Docs. I'm using Excel right now, but I'm editing the same file I was ex editing with the web-based version. So I can switch back and forth between the web-based version and the version on my computer without messing up how the document looks. Okay? So you know, and I can go ahead and I can you know, make my changes, etc., and I can save. And it's going to upload that file to SharePoint automatically. So I don't have to save this to my computer and then upload it to SharePoint Online. It's just going to do that for me. Um, now I showed you going to the web interface and going to your documents, but probably some of you have some users who don't even know how to navigate their local computer in order to find things, right? Like they don't go to, they don't open up Windows Explorer and then click on My Documents and then browse. They actually just open up the application and they click File Open, and if it's not there, they don't know what to do, right? And we can do the same thing um, here. So I can open up Word, and I can go to Open Other Documents. And here I have my OneDrive, which I'll talk about later, and I have my SharePoint environment. So I can go into my SharePoint environment and I can browse it the same way I would um, any, any sort of um, drive. So this is SharePoint and I can open up Documents and I can open up each of those individual documents right here. Okay? If I go to File, Open, Recent, this shows me all of my recent documents that I've opened. Okay? So I don't have to go to the web interface necessarily. I can do just about everything directly from the application. If I were to create a new document, um, I can also save this document directly to Office 365. Okay? So again, with Office 365, I don't have to save stuff to my local computer and then upload it. And everything is stored in, um, in the web interface. Okay, so a couple things I want to show you in here. Um, one thing I want to show you is licensing. So this particular product, this is Office 365. I, we have E3 licenses, so I have a subscription to Office 365. So I'm actually logged into Office 365, and I'm, a, I'm licensed this way. So I didn't type in a product key. Okay? So one way you can do it is buy from TechSoup and get the license key and type that into Office. The other thing I can do is I can sign into Office, and I have an E3 license, and so I am licensed inside of Office. And if I leave the organization or if I get a new computer, I can through the web interface unlicense this computer or unlicense this user and give that license to another person, and they can install Office then. Um, and with the E3 licenses or if you pay the $2, um, you can install Office on up to five different devices. Another thing I want to show you is version his history. So if I, um, I can actually check out this document, and when I check it out, no one else can edit it. Right? So this document is just mine to edit right now. Other people can see the old version. Um, and then I can check it back in, and it will ask me to make comments. And when I do that, I create a version. Um, what do you want to bet this isn't going to work this time? Okay. Well, if I had it turned on, I would see different versions of this document right here. So over time, I will accumulate multiple versions. I can compare versions. I, I apparently don't have it turned on in this particular document library. Um, but I can compare versions. So I can see what's changed over time, and I can see who's made what changes. Um, this is a setting where you check in and check out, but you can also have it automatically track all the changes and create a new version for every single time that that file is edited, which is really useful if you have uh, a finance site and you want to track budget versions, or if you have an HR site and you want to track who's accessed and edited you know, job descriptions or salary documents or anything like that. Um, you can do that directly from Office, uh, directly inside of, of the Word interface or the web interface. Um, okay. So that was, that was a lot. Uh, the last thing I want to share here, and then we'll pause for some questions, um, I want to show that we can also share documents with Office 365. So I can do it two ways. I can create a link. This is very similar, feel familiar to you probably if you've used Google Docs. I can create an edit link or a view link. And people with those links will be able to edit or view the document. And they, do not, they can actually use the web-based version of Excel if they want. Um, and you can control whether or not they can edit it or view it. They do not need to log in in order to edit this document. Um, I can also invite people with an email address. And if I have this checkbox checked, 
then they will have to sign in before they access the document. And they don't need an Office 365 account. They just need some kind of Microsoft account, like a new Skype account or a Windows Live account or an Outlook.com account. And when they do that, that invitation gets linked to that account, and they'll need to log in in order to access the document. So this is a really good way to share documents with people outside of your organization. So when we do trainings, I don't send out an attachment with the documentation. Right? I send a link to the documentation in our SharePoint environment. And then when we update that documentation, it automatically gets updated when users access that. Um, okay, um, to, let, let's pause for questions. Becky? Okay, we've got a lot coming in and a lot that I'm we're trying sure, to answer. I'm sure. So we're trying so to keep much. up. So um, can you quickly just describe the difference between OneDrive and SharePoint? I'm going to actually talk about OneDrive in a minute, so we'll get to that. Okay, so we'll hold nice. on to that then. Um, let's see. What is the difference between using SharePoint for a file server, file storage, and something like Dropbox or Box or some other third-party tool? Yep. So those tools, mostly what you do is you synchronize. So with Dropbox, the files are synchronized with your computer, right? So you have all the files on your computer uh, at a given time, uh, which is great if you are traveling a lot because you have everything available to you. But it's really pretty bad at doing things like managing concurrent users, right? And making sure and tracking versions, right? Dropbox doesn't do that for you very well. Um, Box.net doesn't do that terribly well for you. Um, but one of the big features of Office 365 is just a lot of the control that you get over um, sharing and permissions and editing, uh, being able to run audit reports to see who accesses what when. With, uh, with SharePoint Online, you can do file-based encryption so that um, even if a file is downloaded off of SharePoint, it's encrypted and they can't access it if they don't have permissions to access that document. So you really, uh, and then everything's integrated in one place in the Office 365 platform. Everything's really well integrated with Office, right? This thing where I can just go to File Open and I can browse my SharePoint and my OneDrive. You know, you're not going to get that with Box.net unless you're synchronizing all your files, and then you have all those concurrency issues. So, um, and, and also, um, I'll point out it's free. So uh, you know, Dropbox is great, I think, for small organizations, really small organizations who don't deal with a lot of concurrent editing, and they're not so worried about security, and they have the money. Um, and Box.net is good for organizations who just need something really, 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 really simple, and they just can't handle the complexity of SharePoint. Um, but I, I think SharePoint is a really compelling option for a lot of organizations. But I'm not going to say it's the best for everyone. Great. We had some folks asking about you know, if you have a file uh, and somebody edits it, can you roll back to prior versions? Can yep, you restrict absolutely. who can see them? Um, you know, particularly, yep, so you we had quite a few questions about HIPAA compliance and you know, the ability <laughs> to control and limit access. So. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you can control things in SharePoint. You can control uh, permissions um, at the site or the folder or the document library or the document lo um, level. Right? Um, and you can also turn on enforced version history so that any change creates a new version. Um, if you are using um, certain tools, you can also enable audit logging so you can see who has accessed certain documents. Not just edited them, but who has accessed them. Now there, there are some um, – so first of all, Microsoft will sign uh, a HIPAA compliant business agreement with you, which says uh, we do everything we need to do in order to be HIPAA compliant. Right? So Microsoft um, Office 365 is a HIPAA compliant tool. Now most of HIPAA compliance has much more to do with how you use the tool than about the tools themselves. Right? So if people have access to things that they shouldn't have access to, or if they send um, information out that they shouldn't send out in an email, right, then you're not HIPAA compliant even though Office 365 is HIPAA compliant. So it's not going to do you any good just to be on Office 365. But there are a lot of tools inside of Office 365 that can really help you stay uh, safe and secure and compliant with, with HIPAA regulations. The E3 licenses add a lot of additional functionality, uh, like they can detect if you're sending email that has social security number in and automatically encrypt it or it can uh, detect whether or not you put a file in SharePoint that shouldn't have gone there because it has you know, information that should only be kept in your database. Um, or you can do that file-based encryption I talked about. That's all with the E3 license. Um, th but the standard Office licenses can be HIPAA compliant. They just don't have all the safeguards built in to make sure that your policies are actually being followed. And that was a long-winded, not terribly helpful answer, but there it is. I thought it made a lot of sense. So for people who are concerned about HIPAA compliance, that makes probably a lot of sense to them as well. Uh, if you're not concerned with and don't have to oblige by HIPAA compliance, then 
you can just ignore a lot of that. <laughs> um, Absolutely. We had a question. So Christine is saying, you know, is uh, or sorry, it was Claudia who said uh, asked. How do you get your SharePoint? Because she's got her Office 365 open and doesn't see it on her dashboard. Is it something that has to be installed or opened up separately? Um, you might not have licenses. We don't really have time. Or you might not have the license enabled, or you might not have gotten it set up. I mean, oh, 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 it's not called SharePoint. It's called Sites. Uh, don't ask me. But there, this is SharePoint right there. So if I click on that, you'll see all of your different SharePoint sites. This is our main one, and then we have some others for specific purposes. Um, so uh, that might be the problem there. Um, we do have some resources at the end about how to actually uh, be successful with these tools. Um, we, you know, we offer a DIY offering for small organizations who can't afford to really find a partner to help them through the whole thing um, if you need help with that. Um, or you, or you know, we do full implementations, um, but you know, you can also figure it out on your own. And I really support that if that's something you're you're up to. So my guess is that you're just looking at for SharePoint, and it's called Sites. Great. And um, we did just have one other question that came in, just asking, uh, can you limit the time frame that somebody has to view something? Can you say you have access to this for two days, and then it revokes access? You know, I get questions like about that, that a lot. Um, not no. No, is the short answer. Okay, great. So I think we are going to have to move forward so that we can get through great. some more stuff before we finish up. Okay, so um, we're we're gonna we're all we're actually getting there. We're doing pretty well on time. Um, I want to show you a couple other things in SharePoint very very briefly. Um, so I mentioned that you can do other stuff in SharePoint, right? And I just want to give you a taste. This is not where you should start off. You should start off simple with document management, but other stuff you can do with SharePoint. This is an app that we built. Um, to track paid time off. So you can build apps inside of SharePoint that do more than just file management. right? And it's all on the website. People can just go to it. This is an app that's actually available in the App Store, and we track our paid time off. So I can request leave, uh, and then my manager, my executive director gets a notification, and he can approve or, or disprove it. Um, and then we, we can track accruals through the system. So again, you can do a lot of stuff in SharePoint. This is our knowledge base. So we use this to track sort of how-to articles and issues that we've come up with our clients and what we want to do about them. So you can see this is an article, and it has text and a title and a client. And I have this great little filter over here where I can um, you know, look for articles created by a person or what the type is or who the client it's targeted at is. Right? And this all took about an hour to set up. Right? So we can really set this stuff up. We can even track metadata about documents. If I want to have a document library where I'm storing case notes, and I want to know the name of the clinician, and the site at which the, you know, the, the uh, visit took place, and the date of that visit, I can add those fields to the document. And when I save that document, Word will actually ask me to put that information in before it saves the document to Office 365. Um, and then this is another example. This is um, a board portal that we built um, where um, Board members can go in, and you know, here's an example of a meeting, and we can pull lots of information into one page. So this is the information about the meeting itself, but we can show all the people who are attending, the agenda, all the decisions that need to be made at that meeting, and what the voting is. People can vote through this system, all the documents related to this meeting, and past meetings. Right? So this is just another example um, of something that can be built with SharePoint. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I just want to give you a taste of how you can do more than just file management inside of SharePoint Online. So let's move on to OneDrive. OneDrive is actually part of SharePoint. Yes, that's confusing. I agree with you. Um, another really fun thing is that OneDrive for Business, which is what we're looking at right now, is not the same as OneDrive Personal. They're two totally different things. Confused? Good, me too. Um, so, uh, but it is a great product. OneDrive is basically your My Documents folder. right? So SharePoint is your Map Network Drives. It's for things that multiple people access. OneDrive is just for you. Right? And you can share individual documents out of it if you really want to, but there's no good way for someone to go and browse you know, your environment. It's not going to work um, to store things that multiple people access. Right? It's fine for sharing out a file, but it's, it's really mostly to replace your My Documents folder. One of the great things about OneDrive is that there is a synchronization client. Um, so this is my OneDrive. You can see I have green checkboxes next to everything, just like Dropbox. All of the things in my OneDrive for Business are synced to my local computer um, with, that, um, with that synchronization client. Okay? So, um, and I have access to the same things like the, the web apps, etc. So I can edit these documents in the website or on my local computer. 
One really fun thing I want to point out to you is when I go to Save, you can see I have OneDrive Tech Impact, OneDrive Personal. This OneDrive Personal, I can't log into this with, a Microsoft, with an Office 365 account. So if you go and you click on OneDrive Personal and you're trying to sign in with your Office 365 credentials, it's not going to work, okay? Because that's OneDrive Personal, not OneDrive for Business. I know, it's confusing. Um, so you need to sign into your OneDrive for Business, not your OneDrive Personal. So I just want to mention that. Let's drive forward and we'll take a few questions. Um, there's just a couple more things I wanted to show you. Really briefly, this is Yammer, which is a social messaging tool, a social um, networking tool, excuse me. It's very similar to Facebook, but it's just for inside of your organization. So this is my internal Yammer network, and I need a uh, techimpact.org email address. I have groups which I can join, uh, and anyone uh, can create groups. And you can have groups that are restricted and groups that are open. And then people can post things and comment on them. Um, Yammer is a really good tool for increasing you know, a sense of connectedness in your organization. It's not a great like, internal marketing tool. It doesn't really work well if you make people use it. It doesn't work well if you make people post businessy things. But here's a great picture of someone photobombing someone else's picture. That went over very well. Um, so this is a great use of Yammer. One of the really, really huge, important, wonderful things about Yammer is that we can also use it for external communities. So I can invite people outside of my organization to join an external Yammer community. I can create an external community, and then people can join that. So if I have volunteers or partner organizations that I want to collaborate with us, we can invite them to join this Yammer network. And then I have a, a safe and secure and private place to collaborate with those people, and where those people can collaborate with each other. Um, and finally, I just want to really, really briefly show you a couple of other tools. Um, this is Microsoft Dynamics CRM. This is not uh, the first thing you should start with, but it is a constituent relationship management system built into Office 365. Uh, it's not free. You have to pay for it, but it is pretty inexpensive. We have it set up to track um, members and donations, etc. Right? And again, this is all integrated with Office 365 and my Office Suite, so I can look at a contact and I can see where they are, and all their cases and their donations and all that kind of stuff. Um, this is Power BI. This is a dashboarding and reporting tool. This is also an additional fee. This is one of the absolute coolest things about Office 365. This is connected to um, Salesforce right now. But I can connect it to all kinds of things including um, Excel um, or SharePoint or you know, lots and lots of different things. And I can build really cool, really powerful dashboards and reports. Um, okay, so we're at 255. I know that was so much content. We do have a more full version of the demo. Um, that you can attend anytime you want. Becky, do we have time for a couple questions, or do we want to just power through with, with the rest of the slides? Uh, we have time for a couple more, and then uh, we will have to show some additional slides. Uh, some kind of broader questions that we had asking about you know, really what are the skills that you need to move to Office 365? What kind of team do you have to have together uh, from your recommendations? If you are brand new, maybe you are a small organization that only has a five five or ten users, what do you recommend um, you know, as far as people trying to make that transition? Yeah, it kind of depends on what system you are coming from. Um, if you are if you're a small organization, um, I, I would say that you need to know words like DNS and MX record, um, and uh, you, know, you need to know something about permissions. Um, and uh, you know, so you are going to need to know stuff like that in order to be successful. PST. You know, you need to know what auto configure is in order to move to Office 365. Uh, if you're a larger organization, you're going to need to know more stuff like Outlook Anywhere and RPC over HTTP, um, and you know, Active Directory um, and delegated permissions, stuff like that. So, you know, I would say that, um, you know, pretty much any IT person with some server experience is going to be able to get you migrated to Office 365. If you're an accidental techie. You know, I think you're going to need some help. How much help kind of depends on how much time you have and how much interest you have. Um, and you know, we, we do have the DIY offering if you're a small organization and you want to move really cheaply. That, that is an, uh, an option. But you can also find a partner out there. You know, your current IT provider has probably done a few of these migrations. Um, you can talk to us. You can you know, go on Google and find some other partners to help you out as well. The one thing I will say is that the email migration is technical. The SharePoint migration is really people focused. Right? You're asking them to change what they're doing. Right? There's less technical stuff about it, but there's a lot of training that's required, a lot of hand-holding to be successful with that. Yeah, and I guess that's the case with any kind of new technology you'd adopt. You want to make sure that you've got 
support for your staff to actually help them adopt and start using it. Um, we had another couple of general questions that were broad. You know, how does Office 365 work for people who are on Macs? Is there any challenge there for them? Yeah, I mean there's always a challenge, right? You're trying to use Microsoft products on a Mac. Everything is officially supported. Um, I would say that I have to open up Microsoft support tickets more often for issues with Macs than I do with PCs. But that doesn't mean it doesn't work quite well. Um, the new version of Outlook of Office for Mac, which um, I think is just now leaving preview and becoming generally available. Um, I don't know if it's in TechSoup's catalog right now, um, but that it works a lot better with Office 365. Uh, one Great. thing is with, with uh, SharePoint, with a Mac, you use a client that's on the computer called Document Connection rather than the website to open up files. It's actually easier to use in some ways. Okay. And then is there a limit to how much you can store or, or, or size limitations for organizations to consider? There is a limit of 4 gigabytes per file. Uh, and then with SharePoint Online, you get 100 gigabytes for your organization plus 500 megabytes per user. You can purchase additional storage at 20 cents per gigabyte per month. Um, and OneDrive storage is unlimited, but again, that's just for your personal files. And at the moment, there's no way to do selective sync or anything like that, so you really need to have that much space on your computer to use it. Great. So those things we have some links to point you to that we will show right here in just a moment. And so you can read up more on the details and limitations that you may have to live under if you move forward. Those are pretty big limitations, so I would just keep that in mind. Um, I know we've already got a lot of questions in the queue and not any more time to answer them, but if you have additional questions, we'd invite you to continue posting them in our forums. Uh, we'll chat out the link to that in just a moment. It's our Office 365 for Nonprofits thread. Um, I just also wanted to say if you want access to more of Sam's time and other, other folks at Tech Impact, they do have a number of offers on our site uh, for helping you assess whether Office 365 is a good option for your organization. It's a $10 fee. Have a conversation with them and they'll help explain it. Um, they have workshops available for do-it-yourself migrations for smaller organizations with fewer than 20 employees, or for IT departments that may have more uh, technical needs to adjust to and maybe coming from a different tech environment. I've got links to all of these. Uh, we also have a SharePoint online do-it-yourself migration workshop, and then they have one-hour consultations that they can do for $49, which is a great uh, rate for some hands-on tech consulting to help you move through the process. You'll get the links to all of these in the follow-up email as well as the full presentation and recording in a little while. So we have some additional resources I just wanted to point out. Again, that link to Office 365 Nonprofits, they have a great FAQ on that site that answers all kinds of questions about how it works and those size limitations for storage and everything you need to know. Um, we have an article that talks about what you need to know. We have a do-it-yourself overview that we did with Sam last year as a live webinar that you can watch. We had one that we did with Microsoft uh, that's a little bit more of a general introduction to what Office 365 is. So if you need to back up a few steps and get some more of the basics, this might be a good place to start. Um, is, is it right for my nonprofit? That was with Linda uh, from Tech Impact a year ago. Great um, kind of Q&A as to whether it's the right step for your organization. Um, I also want to mention quickly that you, if you are using a box donation or box.com or box.org, you can sync that with your Microsoft Office 365. So if you need additional storage, there are some options that sync up nicely. And I mentioned in the chat that you can use Better World Audio Conferencing to bridge um, that audio. They have a donation through TechSoup's program as well. And then some additional articles, you know, an example from an organization about how they migrated to Office 365 over the course of a few weeks. So a lot of great resources there. They are not clickable on screen, but you will get the slide deck later today. So watch for them, and feel free to pop it open and come to our site to visit any of those resources. Go ahead and chat in one thing you learned in today's webinar that you will take back and try to implement or that will help your organization move forward, whether you decide to do it now or later. And we'd also love to ask you to share this information with your colleagues and friends who may benefit from it. You know, we are a little bit over time, but I'd like to invite you to join us for our upcoming webinars and events. Next Wednesday we'll be talking to libraries about how they use digital advocacy to get their messages out. So if you are joining from a library today, feel free to join us next Wednesday. 
Then we'll have a webinar on Adobe Creative Cloud's Photoshop with some tips for nonprofits on using that which is newly available in TechSoup's catalog. So if you are looking for new Adobe Creative Cloud, come and get it. It's now available. And then we'll have Sam and Linda joining us on the 25th of June to talk about what's new with Office 365. And you can continue asking questions like you did today on that event. And you can explore our archives for more. Thank you so much Sam. I know we zipped through a lot today, and I know we didn't get through all the questions, but we did cover quite a bit. Feel free to connect with us at TechSoupGlobal.org, TechSoup.org on Facebook and on Twitter. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you Kevin for helping on the back end, and mostly thank you Sam for helping answer all of these questions today. You can also connect with him directly at Sam at TechImpact.org to continue asking him questions. So we are grateful to have his expertise. Lastly, thank you to ReadyTalk who is our webinar sponsor today, providing the use of their platform for us to present webinars like this on a regular basis. When you close out, please take a moment to complete the post-event survey and let us know how we did and how we can continue to improve our webinar programs. Thanks so much everyone, and have a terrific day. Bye-bye.